Awesome. Thank you, Stan, for inviting me to be able to come and spend some time with all of you. Um, it's really a privilege and an honor to be here and, uh, and, and to discuss something that I think is a fairly important part in terms of the decisions you'll make in your life. Uh, just so that I have an idea of the audience that I'm dealing with, um, you know, Stan had asked me to talk about choosing a spouse. And, uh, you know, if you think about the big decisions you make in your life, this is probably one of the biggest ones. And it would be helpful for me to kind of know where you guys are at. So I need to, you guys to participate with me. I promise I won't judge. Um, let's talk about um, how many of you guys are married? I heard there's a newly married. Okay, good. So and he, look at how committed he is to his education, that he's here two days after he got married. So a couple of you guys are married. Um, how many of you guys are in a long-term dating relationship with somebody? Okay, perfect. How many of you guys are single? Great. How many of you guys have at least dated once in your life before? Okay, so the vast majority of this should be pretty applicable to, since all of you have either dated once or twice before, or are in a dating relationship, or potentially are married. Um, so I think hopefully this will be something that I think uh, will address things depending upon the stage of life that you're in. Um, I thought I'd begin a little bit with my own story and about my relationship with my wife. You know, I've been married now, this is our 20th year of being married. Uh, so I sound like an old man uh, compared to many of you probably who, you know, been married for two days. So 20 years seems like a long time, but you know, one of, my, one of the funnest things I actually get to do with my patients is, I, especially when I meet an elderly couple, you know, I take care of lots of patients in the emergency department, and you know, I get lots of 70 and 80 year olds that come in after fall. And I always find it very sweet when they come with their spouse. And uh, I often ask them one of the a good icebreaker question when I talk to my patients, hey, how long have you guys been married? And it's always so fun for me when I hear, oh, I've been married for 63 years or 50 years. And my question always afterwards is, hey, what's one piece of advice you'd give me that made your marriage last so long? Because that's a pretty unusual thing nowadays uh, to have someone that you committed to for that long and to stay married and stay in love together. Um, that I think is a pretty cool thing. So I find that's often an interesting way for me to break the ice with my patients as I talk with them. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about my own story that kind of gives you some perspective on where I'm coming from, and uh, perhaps I'll kind of inform some of our discussion. So this is my lovely wife. Uh, her name is Melissa, and uh, uh, as I said, we've been married for about 20 years, and uh, we actually met uh, overseas. So you got to know a little bit about my cultural background, because that'll help kind of inform kind of the ways that I decided to approach dating. Um, so I'm Indian. I was born in India, and I lived there until I was 10, um, so until... I decided to marry my wife. Uh, my parents thought I was gonna be a good Indian boy. That means I was gonna have an arranged marriage. And uh, so when I told my parents, uh, when I was in college, I met a girl that I wanted to marry. It like came out completely from left field because for them, you know, the thought was, you know, hey, I'm gonna have a good Indian son, which means that when the time is right, we will go pick out his wife for him and then he'll say yes or no. And then that's how everybody else in my family has gotten married. And so uh, it was kind of an unusual thing for my parents to have me pick a wife on my own without having their necessarily their input of them choosing the person for me. Um, so the way that I met Melissa, so I uh, went and did my undergrad at A&M, and the Lord had called me from a pretty young age. You know, when I was in high school, I felt very convicted that the Lord was calling me to medical mission. So spe specifically thinking about going to medicine so that I could have an av avenue to be able to uh, use that as a platform to get the gospel into areas that otherwise would be unreached. And so that really informed the way that I thought about a spouse and about what I was looking for. And from the time that I was in high school, I was praying, Lord, when the time is right and it's time for me to get married, um, Lord, help me to find someone that has a similar vision, a similar heart, someone that loves you very deeply and is committed and is willing to go kind of to the ends of the world um, for the sake of the gospel. And so that was, you know, that kind of really restricted the number of people that I would consider as potential spouses for me. And uh, I met Melissa kind of um, unexpectedly. Uh, so I went to work at a mission hospital in South India uh, that was actually between my high school and, and going to college. And my plan was to work there for three months. And then while I was there, um, Melissa came to come work as the house mother and orphanage there. So she was taking care of about 21 kids. And I had no idea who she was. Uh, I was working at the hospital and uh, one of the kids in the orphanage she was working with got sick and they got the stomach flu. So of course, as you know, it's very contagious. And so uh, day one, she brings me one kid that's puking, diarrhea. So I take care of uh, that kiddo with the doctor that I was working with. 
And then after that, like every day for the next two weeks, I would see her because another kid would pick it up and they'd be throwing up and not feeling good, so she'd come back. And so we just had time to talk. And as we talked and talked, we found out that we had a very similar passion in terms of where we thought our life was headed. And uh, after two weeks, we decided we want to get married. Whoa, huh? <laughs> yeah, so very quickly. Uh, but you know, you, you think, wow, that's a really quick time to decide on to marry somebody. Uh, but in some ways, when I think back, I'm not surprised at all because I knew exactly what I was looking for. And same thing, my wife, you know, she had been praying for years about the person that she was wanting to marry. And so when we found that person, we just asked the Lord, you know, is this the right person, right? Do they have a heart for you? Are they passionate about the things that we're passionate about, which is to be able to get the gospel to unreached parts of the world? And I knew that Melissa, the fact that she had already moved herself to India, sight unseen, that she had already made the first step in terms of being able to go to where God had called her to. And so uh, we knew pretty quickly that we were going to get married. You know, although we didn't get married in two weeks. Uh, so we decided we want to get married, uh, but she had a commitment, and the commitment was that she was going to work in India as the house mother of this orphanage and teach at the school. And I was doing my undergraduate, and so we actually then spent three years apart while she spent another two years in India. And uh, it's kind of a, a good story because, you know, it's kind of like back in the 1800s. You know, we had very little access to phones. I think I talked to her once on the phone the first year, maybe once the second year, and she had no internet access her second year, and uh, so everything was written by letters. And so we always joke about the fact that, you know, um, all of our fights took nine weeks to resolve because she would write something, three weeks later I would get it in the mail, I would write back, and then I would go back for three more weeks, and then finally I would get a response three weeks later, and so then finally nine weeks we'd resolve if there's a conflict. Uh, but it's really fun because we look back and we have like a box we keep of our letters that we wrote to one another. It's like over a hundred letters we wrote to each other during those two years. Um, and those are really treasured memories uh, that we have, very atypical for modern day society, I guess. Um, so anyway, she uh, lived there for another two more years. She moved back to be with her family in uh, Nebraska. That's where my wife's from. And uh, she lived there with them for a year while I finished my undergraduate. And then as soon as I finished my undergraduate at A&M, she moved down to Texas and we got married about a month later. And uh, the plan was, you know, as many of you guys have, you know, maybe those are newly married, hey, we're gonna have the season of being married and kind of enjoying one another, learning to, you know, to live with one another, because even though we knew we wanted to get married, we had never actually lived in the same place until the last month before we got married when she moved down to Texas. So there's a lot of things that we hadn't learned about each other, and lots of dating things that normally people do that we hadn't done. And so we thought, oh, we'd have lots of time to kind of explore and see what that's like before we decided we wanted to have children. And we knew, we both knew that we wanted to have kids, and we actually both talked about families, and we said, well, we would like to have a big family. Um, and we thought, well, how many do you think is big? And I said, well, maybe like five or six would be good. And she's like, oh, great. I was also thinking the same. And I said, wonderful. And we talked about, you know, well, you know, we, we want to do that through kids of our own or adopt. And we said, no, adoption should be a big part of our family. So we would probably have some kids of our own if the Lord blessed us with that, and then potentially to have kids in the future through adoption. And so we had kind of agreed on that, but we thought, oh, that would be someplace in the future. And then six weeks after we got married, we found out we were pregnant with our first little one. So very unexpected, and uh, I was a teacher, so this is actually both of us' first year teachers. I taught high school chemistry at DISD. My wife was an English and second language teacher. And six weeks into our marriage as new teachers, we find out that we're pregnant with our daughter, and I'm like, oh my gosh, but this whole idea of going to medicine, medical school, all of that's gone. So I told Melissa, I said, look, I committed to you, and I committed to being a family, and so if you want me to quit this dream of going to medical school, that's fine. I want to make sure that I'm there as a father to our kids. And she said, no, we'll just figure out how to do medical school with uh, a baby. And sure enough, we did. So this is us. I did my training at the Mayo Clinic. And so um, our daughter was three weeks old when we took her 1,200 miles north to Rochester, Minnesota. And uh, this is, I think, day after we got settled in Rochester. Uh, that's our daughter. She's about four weeks old at that point. Her name is Karna. And that's me getting ready to start medical school. So I have lots of jokes about how, you know, the, the week when medical school starts, all the people got, uh, got together at a bar. Um, and we didn't, we, of course, we took along our little four-week-old baby to the bar. And in Minnesota, the rule is if you're under 18, you can't be in a bar after 10 o'clock. And so sure enough, at 9.55, the uh, waitress comes by and says, hey, your kiddo can't be in here. He's going to get kicked out of the bar. And so our daughter has this great story of you know how she was kicked out of the bar at four weeks old <laughs> because she wasn't supposed to be there. But you know honestly, you know I thought life would be so stressful being a parent and being a father, um, being going through medical school. 
And I just think back on that time, and I said, you know, it was such a blessing. You know, in, initially I thought this was going to ruin all my plans. You know, how am I going to get to medical school? How am I going to do well when I have not only the responsibilities of school, but I also have the responsibilities of being a father and taking care of a little one. And I wanted to be present in their life because I couldn't just like check out on my daughter for four years and then check back in when I'm done with medical school and say, hey, dad's here, because those four years I'm never going to get back. And you know, what that I think really forced me to do was force me to think about how am I going to use my time wisely. And I knew there was really a limited amount of time. I said, you know, there's really a certain amount of studying that I can do that's going to be for four hours in the afternoon. And after that, I'm going to have two hours with my daughter in the evening so that I can spend time with her. And I just had to be disciplined. And you know, what I found is that the Lord blessed that. You know, I graduated probably at the top of my class at Mayo. And I don't think you know, I was hindered because of the fact that I had a little daughter with me. Um, and I think it just kind of helped me to focus. And I just knew I had to be efficient with my time and not waste it. And so I'm so glad that I got uh, to do life with my daughter. And so that was uh, our first one. And then uh, next, during my third year of medicine, um, um, our son was born, Luke. Uh, uh, Luke was born about two years after we got there. And uh, it's funny, it was in the middle of the, my internal medicine rotation. And I remember I was doing my rotations. Melissa had to go into labor early. And so I remember parking it in the Mayo parking garage. And then the baby came. And so I left the car there. And then I got a couple days off so I could spend time with her. And the clerkship was great. They gave me a couple days off. And then so I saved my wife for the next couple days. And then I remember on day four, I'm like, I have no clue where I parked. <laughs> and so I remember walking through the entire parking garage for the next like two hours trying to find where I parked my car because you know, everything in the third year as a clerk, uh, when you're doing clerkships, when you're completely sleep deprived and nothing seems to make sense, you can't remember anything. And I thought this was just you know, new daddy brain, but it was also new daddy brain along with being a third year medical student doing internal medicine. So uh, that's our daughter and then that's our son, Luke. Uh, so that's him when he was born, uh, or I guess a couple months after. And so then I finished my training at Mayo, and then I came back to Southwestern for my residency in emergency medicine. And then about six months into my intern year, uh, we had our son Vivek, uh, who joined us in 2009. And we thought, hey, our family, as far as the children that God has blessed us with, is complete. Uh, so we finished my training here in residency, and then after that, uh, you know, our plan was always to go overseas, and so we did. Uh, we spent two years working here to kind of play off student loans, and after that, we went overseas to work at a mission hospital on the border of India and Nepal. There's a whole other story to that. Uh, but we were there for three years. I unfortunately got deported out of the country and we found ourselves back in the US. And uh, we had been praying at that point about adopting and having children as part of our family. And we said, well, we always thought the adoption would happen in India, um, but the Lord had closed that door. So we said, well, that call and that obedience to his call is still valid, even though we couldn't be in India. And so we said, well, we should just adopt, but we'll adopt from the US. And so we said yes to that, and so then, uh, 2017, uh, we were blessed with five more kiddos, and uh, we adopted a, a sibling group of five, and so suddenly our family went from three kids to eight kids, and uh, we now then had eight kids under the age of, I think, 11. So lots of kiddos, and uh, the Lord said, well, there's more that we want to add to your family, and so four months after we adopted the five kiddos, CPS called us and said, hey, there's another little sister that's born. Do you want her too? We said, sure. So then Gabby joined our family, and then a year later, CPS called us again, and they said, hey, do you want another kiddo? She was also born, same family, she needs a home. We said, sure. So this is the most recent picture of our family. We have 10 kids now. Uh, I have five boys, five girls, lots of, lots of fun in our family, and uh, you'll count, one is missing. Our daughter's in college now. She's a freshman or sophomore at Baylor, but everybody else is there. So <laughs> lots of kiddos, lots of family, and uh, I'm so glad I get to do this life with my wife, um, who we have just a, a great understanding of one another and a vision for what God has called us to. And, uh, and I'll talk to you about some of the principles that we applied in terms of our marriage that has helped us uh, to be able to have a life that uh, I think honors the Lord and uh, definitely not an, a boring life, I guess. So um, for those of you that are in that single season, meaning you are not yet married, you're not in a dating relationship, um, one of the big questions is, what do you do now while you're waiting? Waiting for the right person, right? The godly husband that you want, the godly wife that you want. Uh, what do you do while you're in the season of pre preparation? I would tell you that the most important thing that you can do now, if you're not in a dating relationship, is to faithfully walk with the Lord and allow the Lord to refine your character. You'll realize that once you get married, this person that you thought was absolutely perfect is not, and neither are you. 
okay? And unless you work on the things that God needs to work on right now, you'll find that those things, that baggage, will come along with you in your marriage. So the best thing you can do to prepare yourself for marriage is to work on those things and allow the Lord to refine your character. So don't think of this season as a season of like wasted time, right? Sometimes people are like, oh, if only I could get married, you know, then life would be great, right? But the reality is you have a lot of time right now, and that time is valuable time, right? It's a time for you to grow in your walk with the Lord, right? Grow in the areas you're struggling with. If it is anger, if it is issues with pornography, issues of lust, issues of addiction, whatever else it might be, right? To deal with those things now will make it so that you're a much better partner for your spouse whenever God brings the right person to you. So my encouragement would be is don't consider the season of waiting as a lost season, right? Use this really as a time for you to grow in your walk with the Lord. Biblical dating and biblical marriage is really more about being the right person to serve my future spouse's needs and to be a God-glorifying husband or wife rather than finding the right person, right? It's really about how is God going to work on your character, right? What is He going to do to help you be ready to be the right person for that person that God has chosen for you, right? And if you don't work on that part, right, if you don't work on your character, if you don't work on your disciplines now, Right? It's going to be really hard to do that when you have the stress of being with somebody else who's also broken, right? who also has faults, and who will bring out sometimes the worst things about your own character. Right? And so my encouragement to you is really work on those things now and work on helping to make sure that your heart is right with the Lord uh, because that will help you in your marriage. Jesus replied, you know, when they asked him, what is the great commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself, right? There are really two goals in your life, right? What do you need to work on, right? Loving God absolutely, unconditionally, faithfully, right? Make the Lord the first thing in your life now, right? That's the first commandment. And the second is, is learn to love your neighbor, right? Is how do you be generous? How are you being going to be hospitable? How are you going to be self-sacrificing? And how do you build those traits now so that when you're asked, to be sacrificial for your husband or your wife, right? To lay down your rights, right? You know that because you've already done that before, right? And you do that with your friends, right? You are serving your friends, you're serving your family, you're serving your church, you're serving in a way that shows that you're willing to sacrifice your rights and your needs for the sake of somebody else. Because that's what marriage is about, right? It's putting your rights below somebody else's and saying, look, you're valuable to me, you're worth something, and so because of that, I'm willing to do the hard work of being able to serve you, even when it costs me a lot, okay? Psalm 119.1 says, Blessed are those that ways are blameless, who walk according to the law of the Lord, right? Walk in God's laws, walk in His ways, and that will help prepare you for marriage. When Paul's writing to Timothy, he says, Don't let anyone think less of you because you're young. Be an example to all the believers in what you teach, in the way you live, in your love, your faith, and your purity, right? These are all things that Paul is exhorting Timothy, right? He's saying that in the way that you talk, the way that you live, the way that you love, your faith, and your purity, right? Let those things be an example to others, right? And those are things that you can work on even before you ever consider dating somebody else. Okay, a couple more things about preparing yourself. Use this season of waiting to pray for your future spouse and to figure out what are the character traits that you're looking for in that person. You know, Jesus says um, a, to the Apostle Paul in Philippians, says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think it's a healthy habit for those that are, not, that are not in a dating relationship, or even for those that are in a dating relationship, is to start faithfully praying for that person, right? If you don't know who that is, right, pray for them right now. Say, Lord, there is somebody out there that you've destined for me, right? I pray they would grow in godly character, that they would choose you first, that they will learn to be sacrificial, to love you more than anything else in the world, right? And if you start praying that faithfully, then when that right person that the Lord has chosen for you comes into your life, it'll become very evident you've been praying for it, right? And God will use His Spirit to affirm who that is because you've been praying for those godly traits in that person. So again, use the season. This is not a waste of time, right? One of the things that I regularly do for my kids, right? I have 10 kids, so I can't pray for all of them because a lot of time. And so what I do is every day I choose two kids, right? So in my, in, my, in my journal, I have two kids that I pray for each morning. And one of the things that I regularly pray for them, even when the time is like three or four, is I pray for their spouse, Right? It's because I want that even right now, there's a little boy or a little girl that's growing up someplace, and I want that person to grow in godly character so that when the time is right, when my daughter or my son meets that person, they will find someone of noble value. Right? And that's something that you can pray for right now. 
I think it's helpful. Sometimes when you start, the hormones start kicking in and you really fall in love with somebody, right? Sometimes your rational mind and your cognition kind of kicks out, right? And everything becomes, oh man, they just, I just look at them and the butterflies start coming and I get this weird feeling in my stomach and then my brain kind of turns off and I have no idea how to evaluate them. So what is a wise thing to do right now is that before you fall for somebody, is to make a list of traits and characters that you want in your spouse, okay? So what that means is write down, what are the character qualities you're looking for in a spouse? As a husband or as a wife, what are the things that are important to you? And write it down and use that as a reference so that when the person comes and you're like starting to feel the emotions, you go back to your list. When you were like still in your rational mind thinking through, hey, this is what I'm looking for, right? They're like, man, this person is so cute and they got all the right things to say, and you look at my list, and like one of the things is being kind. Man, he's really a jerk, right? Even though he's really cute, he's a jerk. Doesn't meet my character, right? That means he's off the list, right? So part of it is, is if you have those things written down ahead of time, then when the emotions come in, you always have something to look to and say, this is my standard, right? And I'm not gonna compromise on this just because my heart feels a different way right now, okay? So a um, couple of things you can look for. What are some qualities you look for in a spouse, right? Faithfulness, trustworthiness, encouraging, hardworking, generous, and hospitable, right? Do you see one of the lists is not on pretty, handsome, right? Because the reality is, even though they're pretty and handsome now, is that always gonna be the case? Well, hopefully, but not always, right? The reality is that marriage and time changes you, right? And if you build the list based on things that change, the reality is, after about 10 or 15 years, you'll realize, man, I don't look like the way I did when I got married, and neither does my spouse, right? And if you built your foundation on that and how they look or what they sound like or the money that they make, whatever else it is, right, the problem is once those things change, then what happens to your marriage, right? But if you build on things that are things that are of character, right, are they faithful? Are they trustworthy? Do they encourage me? Are they hardworking? Are they hospitable, right? If those are the characters you're looking for, those are things that last, right? And that's what you can build a marriage on. So make that list, and I think one of the things that I was so encouraged, um, um, my wife made a similar list to this. You know, when she was in college, when she was praying for a future spouse, she actually thought she would never find somebody to marry because she actually had, had graduated from college, and she was moving to the, like this remote part of India, and she said, my life as a single woman is what I'm destined to. There is no way I'm ever gonna meet somebody in the middle of some village in India that God is gonna choose for me. And so, but you know, but she knew that there were some things she was not gonna compromise on, and so she made a list of things that she wanted. And you know, what she told me is uh, right after we got married, and she told me this, you know, uh, on, our, on our honeymoon, she can, came back to me and said, you know, what I want you to know, Christo, is that I had made a list many years ago, and what I can look back is that all those things that I prayed for, I see in your character, and that's how I knew that you were the right person. And so for me as her husband, man, what a wonderful thing to know that. Right? One, that she was praying for me for so many years before I ever met her, and that she was looking for these things that were not gonna change with time. And so then when she found the person that she thought, this is one that has all these characters I'm looking for, she knew. And that made me so wonderful, you know, feel great as a husband, like, wow, I meet these, you got a big list of things that you needed to meet, and I met those for you, which is why you chose me to be your husband, and that's such a wonderful thing. So I would encourage you, if you never thought about it, right? Take some time, pray about it, and write down a list. What are the things you're looking for in a spouse? And then keep that as reference. So when the right person comes, you check the list and say, hey, do they meet the list? And don't compromise, right? It's not like you can grow them into becoming a better husband later on. You get what you get, right? And then you gotta deal with it. So you gotta figure out, are you fine with that or not? And the best way to figure that out early on before your emotions get in is to have a list of objective traits you're looking for and ask them, is this somebody, and pray through, is this somebody that's gonna meet those characters? Yes, Stan. Now, uh, I was just thinking, you know, as someone that was single for 30 plus years, uh -huh. I too had a list. And um, when I met Karen, she, she did not. Okay. And I realized that lists, I mean, for me, don't work. Mm -hmm. Because lists, you know, my list should have been that list right there. Uh -huh. But my list was so different uh -huh. that when I met Karen, I was like, well, she doesn't fall into this, you know, category or, uh -huh. um, but um, 
But that's so right, though. That's the, you know, so the, that the, the issue maybe is not the list. The issue is choosing the right list, <laughs> OK? <laughs> so that's what I would say. <laughs> so here's what I would say, is that if you're not sure these are good traits, ask a godly mentor, hey, these are the things that I'm praying for. Are these good things to pray for in a spouse? And they can say, man, this is not going to last. Take that off your list, right? So having godly, you know, somebody that's been married maybe for 50 years or 40 years, say, hey, these are things I'm looking for in a spouse. Is this a good thing to look for, right? And they can tell you, yeah, that sounds like a good thing, or no, that's not a good idea, right? So I think to be able to have an objective thing, and again, these are all things, right? None of these are things that are not found in the Bible, right? These are all things that it talks about as far as godly traits that you want to see in a person. And if those are there, then those are ones that you can build a marriage on, okay? So that's one thing I would encourage you to do. <clears throat> okay. This is going to be hard for some of you, but I think it's wise. I would say that prefer singleness to an unwise marriage. What do I mean by that? Sometimes we get into our late 20s or 30s, especially if you're in medicine or a, a professional field, right? You're going to school for a long period of time. You're like in your mid-20s or, or maybe in your 30s at this point, and you're like, man, the right person hasn't come. You know, like, I really want to get married. Maybe I should just compromise, right? And just marry someone that maybe it'll mean all the stuff, but eh, it's okay. Everybody else is getting married. All my friends have got spouses, and they've got kids now. I'm not married yet. You know, like, man, what a loser I am, right? That's what sometimes people get to that point, right? But here's the warning to you, right? It is better for you to be single than for you to marry someone that's ungodly, Amen. right? So remember that this commitment you're making is a commitment. You're going to be with this person for 50 to 70 years, right? It is the longest relationship you're going to be in. And so you'd rather choose to stay single rather than to marry somebody that's going to make you miserable because they've got ungodly traits, right? So I would say, even if it seems really hard, to wait, it's better to wait and be single rather than to mess up your life and live in a relationship that's going to just be horrible for you and for your spiritual walk because this person is abusive, unkind, disrespectful, not faithful, just because you want to get that check mark of I'm married, right? So be prefer to be single rather than to go into an unwise marriage, okay? Now, is everybody called to singleness? Um, the reality is that's not true, right? You know, there are some people that are called to be single, and I think really it's a gift that God gives, right? It's not an easy thing, right? God made us with certain desires, right? You know all about anatomy and physiology. You know that we all have reproductive organs and reproductive hormones, and the natural inclination of the human heart, right, is that we desire to be with somebody else, right? We desire to have sexual intimacy with somebody else, and so to have the gift of singleness is something that the Lord really has to call you to. And there are some of you that might be called to that, but you need to pray and ask the Lord for that. In fact, Paul writes about this in 1 Corinthians 7. He says, Now for the matters you wrote about, it is good for a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But since sexual immorality is occurring, which means, hey, because hormones happen, right? Each man should have sexual relationships with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. The husband should fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife does not have authority over her body, but yields it to her husband. In the same way, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but yields it to his wife. Do not deprive each other except through mutual consent and for a time, so that you may devote yourself to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all of you were as I am, because Paul was single, right? But each of you has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now to the unmarried and the widows I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So what he's saying is that Singleness really is a gift that the Lord gives, right? There are some people that the Lord gives the ability to be able to say no and to put those desires to the side and say, look, my first and only priority is going to be the Lord and falling with Him, and I'm willing to give up that desire to be with somebody else, right? But that really requires some time before the Lord, right? There's not very many people that are called to that, okay? But if that's you, it's not a bad thing, right? In fact, Paul says that he wishes that a lot of people could be like him, right? Because what that gives you then is the ability to be dedicated to things of God without having to worry about earthly things as far as having to take care of wife and kids and other things. And it gives you freedom that otherwise wouldn't be there. But really, it's a gift, and it's something that you need to pray to the Lord about. Okay, so that's about people that are not yet. So the people, a lot of you that raised your hands says, I'm not yet dating. I've dated once in the past, but uh, not right now. That's some things you can do right now is to prepare yourself. Okay, what about for those that are you dating? What are some advice that I can give you, okay? Remember that marriage is really the second most important decision in your life, right? If we say that the most important decision in your life is your relationship with the Lord, number two after that is picking who you're going to marry, right? So don't start this conversation in a, 
or approach it in a trivial way, right? This is a really important decision because it changes the course of your life and what you're gonna do with your life. So approach it prayerfully and approach it with a lot of weight because it is really the second most important decision you'll make. So the first question is, are you ready to marry? Okay, so when you date somebody, I think it's wise to not start a relationship unless you're ready and prepared for marriage. Okay, what do I mean by that? I don't think this idea of like just dating to find things out, dating for fun, um, is really a wise thing. And here's why I say that, okay? Because dating by its definition, right, is two people choosing to be intimate with another, right? Hopefully before marriage is intimacy in terms of emotions and sharing of your heart and things that are important to you. And the reality is that if you're not ready for marriage, it's just asking for a lot of temptation. What do I mean by that? So what I mean by that is that when you are in a relationship, right, and you really start, the hormones start going, right, and you start feeling for somebody, right, the natural, the reason why God created those hormones is that the natural inclination is that that should eventually lead to sexual intimacy, right? But the problem is that if you're not ready for marriage, there's all these passions burning, but no place for it to go, right? And so it is really not a wise thing to start dating somebody if you're not actually ready to get married. And the reason is because it just offers lots of room for physical and emotional entanglement that's hard on both of you emotionally and spiritually. So my recommendation to you is, you know, many of you are at the point where you can potentially consider getting married, right? And if you're at that point, like, hey, I am ready to move forward in marriage, right? At that point, that's the right time to date. But if you're not ready for marriage, you're not, I'm not getting married for five more years, don't date for five more years, right? And, and the reason is because when you engage in a relationship, the natural tendency of your heart, right, is that you want to get closer to them. You want to show them that you love them and care for them, right? And the reality is one of the ways that human beings do that is through intimacy. And the problem is, is that if this thing gets drawn out for long periods of time, there's just a lot of opportunity for lots of things that shouldn't happen to happen before marriage. So my advice to you is that if you're not ready for marriage, don't date, right? But if you're like, hey, I'm ready, I'm ready to get married in six months or a year, now's the time to start dating, okay? I think one of the absolute unconditional rules that you have to have in your mind, especially as a Christian, is that you date someone only that has a committed relationship to Christ, okay? What do I mean by that? It really has to be an absolute rule because 2 Corinthians 6.14 says this, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness? Deuteronomy 7.3 says, you shall not intermarry with them, giving your daughters to their sons, or taking their daughters for your sons. This idea of missionary dating, I think, is not a good idea, okay? And the reason is, you know, if the most important thing in your life is the Lord and your relationship with them, but that isn't the most important thing for the person you're interested in dating, right? Your marriage is always going to struggle, right? Even when you've had, you know, when I think about my own marriage, right? Even when we've had really hard seasons of our life, right, where it's been so difficult, the thing, the common bond that has kept us together has been our mutual relationship and our mutual faith in Christ, right? If my wife didn't share my faith and trust in the Lord in the way that I also wanted to walk with the Lord, it'd be really hard for us to make decisions, especially when it comes to things like having kids. How do you raise them up, right? It's just going to be a, a, a future of conflict. So the best way we can avoid that is don't make the decision to date somebody unless they have a relationship with the Lord and are committed in their walk with Christ. Stan. Can you explain yeah. So missionary dating is the idea that you like somebody and they also want, you know, they're not a believer. And so the idea is that you date them in the hope that as you date them, they will get to learn about Christ and hopefully come to become a believer. And then hopefully that can continue in terms of having a relationship with them, with you, so that hopefully you can eventually get married, right? The problem with this is that, well, if they come to the Lord, what a wonderful thing. But the reality is there's no guarantee, right? And the problem is that if your heart is already there, right, you're already interested in them, what happens then when they don't decide to follow the Lord? And then you're stuck in a really difficult decision, right? I, my heart really feels, I really love them, I really care about them, but they don't value the thing that's most important in my life, right? And then that makes life really difficult. So the best thing to do is that if they're not a believer, be friends with them, help them to come to know the Lord, but don't engage them in an emotional level because it's just asking for lots of entanglement, lots of problems in the future, okay? 
I think when you're dating, it's really important to get wise counsel from others. That means from other people in your church, your parents, friends. You know, sometimes you think, man, man parents are so old, and, uh, and, and, and I don't care about their parents. You know, especially if you have believing parents, right, people that know the Lord, I think it is really wise to get their opinion, right? Because what do they care most about? They care most about making sure that you have a wonderful life ahead, right? Their goal is not to make you miserable, right? And so getting their opinion getting their years of wisdom to, to evaluate somebody you're considering is, I think, very wise, right? And if you don't have that, let's say that you, you come from a family where people aren't walking with the Lord, right? People have always given you godly mentors, right? People like Stan and Karen are there. There's other older physicians, other older mentors that are there that walking with the Lord that you can say, hey, look, this is somebody that I'm interested in. Would you have lunch with them and talk with them? And you know that's been the rule that we've had with our family, with our kids, right? I don't allow any of my kids to date um, until they're in college. And uh, you know, my daughter was interested in somebody in high school, and as soon as I heard she was interested, I said, "Hey, I want to have lunch with him." And uh, me and my uh, wife <laughs> took this poor 11th grader to lunch, and we talked. And uh, at the end of that conversation, we said, "Man, this person um, is not walking with the Lord, right? His heart is not in the right place." And so we told our daughter, I said, "Wait." If, let him go to college, let's see how he walks with the Lord. If the Lord is really the most important thing in his life, then that will become evident, but I would not engage. And by God's grace, she was willing to listen to us. And she said, okay, Dad, I'll wait. And what happened is, after a year of being in college, she's like, yeah, he doesn't follow the Lord. He doesn't love him. And so we're so glad that she's willing to listen to us, right? But that's your role now, right? Like, God put parents into your life. God put older people in your life for a reason, right? You know, you might know a lot at 22 or 24 or 26, but you don't know everything, right? And people that have had many more years of wisdom, it's wise to get their counsel and to ask them, hey, can you talk to them? See what they're at. Give me some perspective. Is this somebody that's right for me? And so I think it's really wise to get counsel. Okay. I think when you date somebody, it's really important to date someone that has the same vision and calling in life, okay? I think what I mean by that is that it's not just important to marry somebody that's a Christian, but it's to figure out what is your calling in life, right? There are people that are called to be Christians that are called to live a suburban life, right? There are people that are called to be Christians that are called to go to the ends of the earth, right? If you're the suburban life person trying to marry the person that's called to the ends of the earth, man, you're going to struggle the rest of your marriage because either place, somebody's going to feel as though somebody is always at conflict, right? Because one place, one person will feel like, man, I'm not following what God's kind of calling me to do, and the person will feel the same way. And so I think talking about what's our vision for life? And so that's why I was so glad for my wife, right? I said, you know, I'm committed to being overseas and to work in India long term. And the fact that my wife had already made that decision before she ever met me, that made it so much easier for me to make that decision. So, um, so I think these are some things you need to talk about. You know, what is the most important thing in their life? What is their calling? Does it align with yours, right? Don't just go along for the ride. And don't think that once I get married, I'll change my spouse and make them convert to my side, right? The reality is you get what you get, right? And they might change, but there's a strong possibility they might not. So having these conversations with them early on, I think is worthwhile. I think other things that, you know, that I think are important to consider, like, you know, what type of life do you want, right? Do you imagine yourself living in the city? Do you imagine yourself living out in the country? Kids, some kids, no kids, lots of kids, adoption. These are all things that I think is worthwhile to talk about beforehand. Otherwise, they become areas of conflict later on in your marriage. So having a similar vision can help you overcome many differences. But if your calling is different, it's very hard to find unity in marriage. I am so thankful that because our calling in terms of missions, in terms of adoption was the same, even when we went through some really hard times, at least we could draw back on this common vision that the Lord has given us to our family, and we could rely on that to kind of get us through these tough times. Okay. I know we are down to like two minutes, so I'll finish up really quickly. Okay. A couple more things of advice for dating. Be ready to commit or disengage. What do I mean by that? Especially for the men that are out there, right? In the way that Christ initiated with us, my expectation is that all of you will willing to do that with your future spouse-to-be. Right? What that means is that you set the tone for the relationship. Right? This whole idea of people dating for four or five years and not making a commitment to marriage, I think it's just foolish. Right? It doesn't serve God. It doesn't serve your life. Right? It's really hard for someone to make you know, decisions about the future if they don't know, hey, what is, where does our future lie? Right? Are they really committed to me or not? Right? So what I mean by that, when you decide, hey, I'm ready to date somebody, is make a decision fairly quickly. Right? It doesn't have to be in two weeks like I did. Right? But I would say six months to a year is more than enough time for you to figure out if these godly characters are there, and at the end of that time decide, this is the right person or it's not the right person, 
right? And if it is, move forward with marriage. And the reason why I say that is because tagging people along, hoping that someday you will come up with the courage to say, will you marry me, is not kind to them, right? It doesn't make it easier for them to make decisions about their future. So I think if you're committed to somebody and you want to be in a relationship with them, make sure that they're a priority, right? And that means you're ready to get married, and when that person, you know, you prayed about it and you asked the Lord, say, hey, is this the right person? If it is, commit and say, yes, let's move forward with marriage. And if it's not, back out and say, look, I don't think this is the right person God has for me, and we need to stop dating, right? I think that's better than carrying down some for many, many years, and then all the times, right, where there's times for temptation, times for you to do the wrong thing, it's so much harder, right? It's much easier when you're married, right? Because then all those feelings that you have, there's some place for it to go to. But when you're not married, there's not that many ways you can express that you love somebody beyond just like telling them that's within biblical guidelines. So my encouragement to you is that if you're dating somebody, commit and decide to move forward or stop and say, hey, this is not for me. Guarding your purity, right? Um, Song of Solomon writes about this in 1 Thessalonians, same thing. God wants you to be holy, to keep clear of all sexual sin. I think one of the greatest ways that Satan can cripple your, your spiritual life, especially the season of dating, is to allow for sexual temptation and for you to fail in that part, right? It makes you feel like a total failure. It makes you makes the other person or you feel like they're taken advantage of. Essentially, you get all the benefits of marriage without any of the commitment, right? That's not serving them. That's not the way that God loves us, right? God committed himself fully to us, and that's the same way we should commit ourselves to our future spouses. If you're really serious about this, put your money and your mouth or your ring where it's worth it. You know, like, you know, if you really say that you really are important to me, then say, I'm willing to take, take the next step in marriage so that there can be full consummation of that desire that we have for one another. So um, that's what I would uh, end with. There's some more things about medicine-specific things, but I'll hold off on that because I think we can, uh, I need to get you guys to your class. So. Um, I'll stick around. I know some of you guys have to go, uh, but if there's any other questions you have, specifically about what do you do in this period of singleness or in this period of dating, I'm happy to stick around and talk, uh, but I appreciate you giving my time. Do we have questions? Okay. Any bottom? No questions? Everybody's figured it out. (laughs) (laughs) Sure. Uh, So what you said, people who are dating but just due to life circumstances, find themselves unable to marry at the moment. Like, so together, we don't want to marry each other. Yeah, so I guess the question would be, what is this life circumstance that makes it hard? Like, let's say somebody's in school six hours away. Say it again? Being a broke student. Being a broke student. Being broke. It is so good to be broke and marry together than be broke and single. I, and I, I'm serious, right? So I think that's what you have to say, is that if, number one, you're not in a position to get married, then the question is, should you be dating in the first place? Right? Because the problem, again, is opportunities for temptation. Right? And what I would say is that you know, if you're a student, there's nothing that says you can't get married. Right? You can figure out how to get married as a student. Right? You know, the question might be, you might have to sacrifice this idea of having the perfect wedding where you're going to spend $50,000 or $100,000 in the marriage. You might have to say, look, I'm willing to get married in a barn. That's where we got married. It was in a 4-H barn in Nebraska. And we spent $4,000 on our wedding, which would seem crazy, but that's what we could afford. Right? But I'm glad that I had those really hard years of being in medical school with my wife. So when the years of plenty came, she had walked with me through the really hard times and times when you, there was plenty. Right? And so I think that's really the question is that you'd ask yourself, look, if I'm not ready to get married now because there's life circumstance, right, is it my business to date right now? And perhaps if it's the right person, they're willing to wait right? and say, look, I really am com- I, I want to marry you, but I just can't do it because I'm in school. and that's." more of a priority meet to meet right now than being in a relationship, then I think you make that clear and see if that person is willing to wait on you. And if not, then disengage and say, hey, look, I'm gonna wait, right? But the problem is, you know, what I'll tell you is that the longer you're in a dating relationship, the longer it plays out, man, like that's the reality of your human heart, right? You want to look, show somebody you love them, right? And no other way will Satan get to you and your spiritual walk than this area of, spiritual, uh, of sexual purity. And my recommendation is, don't make that hard on yourself, right? Why, you know, this is like, you know, when Proverbs talks about sexualism, right, it talks about pouring, you know, coals on your lap, right? That's what you're doing, right? If you really love somebody and you want to be in a relationship with them and you're committed to them, man, follow through and get married. It might not look the way that you want it to look, right? But at least it prevents you from having to go down this path of, sexual temptation. Because the reality is sometimes you'll be sexually intimate with somebody and that person won't work out. And now you have the emotional and physical scars of being in that, with that relationship with that person that you're not taking into the, your next relationship. So my advice to you is, you know, like, 
man, make that period as short as possible, right? If you are certain this is the person, move forward, right? And you can figure it out, and honestly, <laughs> same thing, lots of things that are difficult as a student, it's a lot easier when there's two people contributing, right? That's one of the great things, that's why marriage works, right? Is that because you're not one person against this big world, it's two people, right? I'm paying $1,000 for rent, man, it sure is good to have two people paying rent for $1,000, right? So there's a lot of advantages that you get from marriage that you won't think about, right? And now when I think about it, I'm like, oh, it's so good that I always have a, a date, right? I don't have to worry about, hey, do I need to ask somebody out to go out to dinner? I'm always have my wife with me, and it's fun to be able to have her come along, right? When you make decisions, right? I'm not having to make decisions on my own. I can always have her to come by and make decisions with me. And so I think there's a lot of wonderful you know, benefits of marriage um, that sometimes I think we put these artificial constraints and say, oh, I can't get married in the season because X, Y, or Z, right? But many of them are just like social things that we put on that probably aren't biblical and definitely not requirements in the Word of God, right? And so my encouragement too is that if you really feel committed to marriage, move forward with it, right? There's nothing that says you have to wait until everything is just perfect. And that's part of, again, laying down these dreams and say, look, is this a person of character, right? Do they value our purity more than having the perfect day on the wedding, right? And if our purity is more important than that, then we'll figure out some way to make the marriage work. So that'd be my advice to you. Any other questions? And I'll tell you that, you know, I waited three years, and the only reason <laughs> that I waited for three years and it worked was because she was 10,000 miles away from me. I really like my wife, and it'd be really hard to keep my hands off of her <laughs> in the same place. Now, I, that's, that's the reality, right? And so it helped a lot that we were far apart from one another, so the opportunities for us to interact was fairly limited until we got married. And so that's why it worked. But if you're in the same place, you're saying each other all the time, I'd say, man, you know, move forward with marriage. If this is the person you prayed about and you feel conf confirmation from the Lord this is the right person, move forward, right? You're not going to gain anything except lots of extra temptation by waiting a long time. Do you want to close in prayer? Yeah, let's do that. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for these group of men and women that have gathered here, Lord. I'm so glad to see that they're wanting to seek your will. Lord, I know that many of them are in the stage of singleness. Some are in the stage of dating or just being newly married. I just pray, Lord, that you would help them to um, build their lives upon a solid foundation, Lord. And that foundation is you. And I pray that they would value you and the things that you care about, Lord, godly characteristics that they can look for in a spouse, and that they would uh, help pray for uh, their future spouse as they are waiting, that uh, they would have godly character, Lord, things that would last for eternity. And I pray, Lord, that as they grow through this time of waiting and this time of uh, preparation, Lord, that you'd work in their hearts to build in them uh, discipline and godly character so that when the time comes, Lord, that uh, they would be the right person uh, for their future spouse. We pray this in your son's name, Jesus. Amen.